Welcome, dear colleagues. Uh, welcome to all of you to this very special session for us uh, within the context of the Local and Regional Governments Day at COP in Glasgow. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us, those online and also those that are uh, online but on uh, site there um, at COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, we are delighted to organize uh, this session of our Policy Council on Safer, Resilient and Sustainable Cities Capable of Facing uh, Crisis within the context of this very important day. And the day has started strong. In fact, um, it couldn't start better, actually. Uh, we have been welcomed uh, by the UN Secretary General. Um, Secretary General Gutierrez has received a, a joint delegation of the LGMA uh, and the Global Task Force. Um, he has said, he has made really very strong statements um, uh, to the delegation, uh, putting um, the trust of, of future transformations very much in the hands of local and regional governments committing to ensuring that the new multilateral system, the renewed multilateral system will be multi-level and inclusive. And also acknowledging some of the remaining challenges uh, that, that we have as, as humanity. Um, it has been a very inspiring uh, conversation indeed. And I am sure that some of the mayors that have been there and, and that might be joining us uh, today will be able uh, to share some of those insights, a good way to start, but also very important for us to acknowledge the efforts that the joint uh, constituency is making in Glasgow. Um, the different networks are, are, are going there together, working hand in hand. We are very proud of our pavilion um, in, the, in the blue zone that has been hosting many relevant uh, discussions uh, throughout uh, the COP. And we are particularly happy about some of the strong uh, messages that our delegations have been delivering there. We are also happy about some of the commitments that national governments are making, but we are still missing some critical corner uh, stones uh, for us, particularly in relation to multi-level uh, governance. Multi-level uh, governance, uh, national, uh, nationally determined uh, uh, commitments, including local determining, uh, determined uh, commitments, um, are very critical uh, for us if we want to ensure that many of the inspiring um, initiatives and solutions that are being found at local and territorial level can actually have an impact and a scale up uh, and be part of the solution um, in the global uh, discussions. Um, some of the results of the COP, let's face it, they, they, they are disappointing because we might not be going far enough, but there is a lot to build uh, around. And the discussion that we want to have here today is to, is, is to focus around the priorities. We are acknowledging together that we have a climate emergency, but um, the difficulty right now, right here, is that the climate emergency is colliding with other emergencies that are equally important. The migration emergency, linked to climate, but also uh, due to other situations. Uh, the health emergency that we are also acquainted with, and it's a true social emergency that is um, is, is due to to inequalities, and and um, and the lack of inclusion of a very high percentage of the people that live in our cities today. So within this background, our constituency is very committed to redefine. Um, uh, equality in our cities, to change the way that we are relating to nature, to uh, promote transformative uh, policies in relation to inclusion, equality and accessibility, and also to ensure that these efforts are accompanied by an all of government um, approach with a renewed uh, governance where the territorial 
uh, approach demonstrates the symbiotic relationship between the rural and the urban. The urban era is not an era of big cities alone uh, for us. So some of these are the issues that we are going to be um, to be discussing. Uh, we will be paying also a special uh, attention to uh, to the role of food systems, uh, rethinking food systems. Uh, we'll also uh, be talking about the importance of solidarity um, in, in the definition of the global agendas, uh, in particular in, in view of, um, of the resilience agenda that we have. Resilience cannot be built by one community alone. It it needs to be a truly territorial effort that goes beyond uh, borders. This is the framework uh, that we have uh, before us. So I will not be uh, longer. Um, I am delighted to uh, welcome uh, you all. And uh, please do consider this as part and parcel of the del deliberations um, in, in Glasgow. We might not be able to impact the negotiations that are now starting to close up, but we are certainly going to be able to impact the future policies and the implementation of the commitments. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I will be now giving the floor to uh, Sami Kanam, uh, the member of the Executive Council of the City of Geneva, uh, the chair of our uh, permanent working group on territorial prevention and management of crisis and co-chair of this space of our policy council. Welcome, I am delighted to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Emilia. Thank you very much. Uh, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour à tous et tous. C'est évidemment un plaisir de vous retrouver à l'occasion de la réunion de ce Conseil politique et de vous souhaiter la bienvenue en tant que co-président de ce Conseil. Nous sommes toutes et tous d'accord que cette réunion se déroule au cœur d'un événement très important pour l'avenir de la planète et donc de nous tous, la COP26 à Glasgow. Les catastrophes climatiques sont de plus en plus importantes et très concrètes pour les populations, et les États devraient en théorie se montrer à la hauteur de l'événement afin de répondre à l'urgence climatique. Comme l'a dit Emilia Seitz, on n'est pas sûr que les résultats globaux de la COP seront à la hauteur de nos attentes, mais il y a aussi des progrès concrets. Et surtout, nous, les gouvernements locaux et régionaux, on a un rôle crucial à jouer dans ce contexte. Je ne peux que remercier et féliciter ces GLU d'avoir contribué à organiser cette journée consacrée aux gouvernements locaux et régionaux afin que nos voix et nos préoccupations soient davantage entendues par les États. Et je ne peux que me réjouir qu'une rencontre ait pu avoir lieu entre ces élus et la Task Force avec le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Antonio Guterres. En effet, nous, gouvernements locaux et régionaux du monde entier, nous sommes aux premières lignes de cette crise climatique qui est en train de changer le monde sous nos yeux. Nous sommes confrontés aux températures qui ne cessent d'augmenter et qui affectent nos populations, en particulier les personnes les plus fragiles. Nous sommes contraints de faire face à des inondations qui touchent nos villes, que ce soit par la fonte des glaces ou par des pluies de plus en plus abondantes. Nos populations quittent les zones les plus ravagées et deviennent des réfugiés climatiques qui doivent être secourus et protégés. À Genève, nous prenons ce sujet très au sérieux. Raison pour laquelle nous avons déclaré l'urgence climatique en 2020 et avons mis en place des mesures pour réduire nos émissions de CO2. Concrètement, nous avons pour but, avec ces mesures, de réduire de 60% les émissions de gaz à effet de serre sur notre territoire d'ici à 2030, ainsi que d'atteindre la neutralité carbone en 2050. Mais le changement climatique n'est malheureusement pas qu'une des crises que nous, gouvernements locaux et régionaux, devons affronter. Elles sont désormais de plus en plus fréquentes et multiformes. Comme nous le voyons avec la pandémie du Covid-19, une crise peut être à la fois sanitaire, sociale et économique. Pour évoquer ces sujets de manière concrète, le 29 novembre prochain, de 10h à 16h30, heure de Genève, la ville de Genève est citée une unie France, organiseront une réunion en ligne du groupe de travail de CGLU sur la prévention et la gestion territoriale des crises. 
En tant que président de ce groupe de travail, j'ai le plaisir de vous y convier afin d'y participer. Lors de cette réunion, des représentants des gouvernements locaux du Mali, du Ghana et du Liban seront avec nous. Ils présenteront, entre autres, les avancées concrètes qui ont été possibles grâce au projet d'aide mené dans le cadre du dispositif du Fonds international de solidarité de CGLU. Ce fonds vise à venir en aide aux municipalités qui ont été affectées récemment par des catastrophes. Par exemple, Beyrouth, ma ville natale, qui a été frappée en août 2020 par une terrible explosion dans le port qui est encore dans nos mémoires. À cette occasion, une session spéciale sera organisée par l'équipe Learning de CGLU, que je remercie ici pour la collaboration. Cela promet donc d'être une session très intéressante et instructive. J'espère avoir l'occasion, le plaisir de vous y voir à cette occasion. Mais avant cela, je vous souhaite à toutes et tous une excellente réunion du Conseil politique. Merci beaucoup et belle journée. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for the, your commitment to, to push uh, for this agenda. Unfortunately, we have many cases uh, like, like Beirut uh, around the world, and we look forward to addressing those challenges. Very recently, a similar exposure has taken place in, in Freetown. Uh, we are delighted to have this mechanism to, to support activity there. And, and, and we know that um, the climate emergency Emergency is going to trigger more and more of, of these situations, um, and sometimes fully man-made and, 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 and sometimes um, hazards due to the natural uh, changes. So thank you for, uh, for this. Allow me now to, uh, to give the floor to the next, uh, uh, to, to, to give way to the next uh, segment on uh, multi-level action for inclusive uh, recovery, which is going to be uh, facilitated by Sally uh, Ludon, Chief Executive of the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. Kosla, in fact, you are our host uh, there. Uh, Sally, a very busy period for, uh, for COSLA, so we are truly honored uh, to have you uh, with us. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Good luck with the moderation. Thank you, Amelia, and what a pleasure it is to be with you all this afternoon, so welcome, uh, everybody. The, I'm Chief Executive of Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, we are the membership organisation for 32 councils, all 32 councils in Scotland. Uh, the councils in Scotland are all unitary authorities delivering a, a whole range a, of local services from education, transportation, roads, waste, a, social care, the list goes on and on. So. It, it, all a range of services that are so important in relation to climate change. Uh, this morning I have been engaged with a, a, a number of events that looked at the difference that local government is making to a uh, climate change uh, in Scotland and across the world and it's been truly inspiring to see the leadership that is coming from cities uh, and local government uh, across the world. And, and of course, we know that local government's not just been waiting for COP26 uh, for a new declaration or for whatever's going to come out of COP26. Local government has been taking action for a long time. Uh, and there's been a huge amount of leadership uh, from councillors uh, and officers. Um, the other thing that come out really starkly, uh, and it'll be no surprise to anybody in this meeting, is um, we need to do this in a way that doesn't make an unequal world more unequal. And the passion that I heard today, all throughout today, of people determined to try and make the world more equal through climate change uh, and not add to the inequality that's already uh, there. So with those opening remarks, um, I'm going to ask for forgiveness on um, uh, the pronunciations of people's names that I'll do this afternoon because I'll be living hopeless uh, at it, but I shall try my best. So please forgive me uh, if I say your name wrong. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, a series of five speakers uh, to make their contributions. And if I could ask each of the speakers to... To, to stick to three to four minutes uh, per contribution. 
uh, if, if you go on, then I'll, I'll, I'll try diplomatically to come in uh, to ask you to uh, wind up. So with that introduction, can I ask Fernando Gray, uh, who is the mayor uh, of Esteban in uh, Argentina and vice president of something I really cannot pronounce. Uh, so please feel free to uh, introduce yourself and get a hand over to you, Fernando. Hi, Sally, and apologies. It seems that uh, Mayor Gray has had something come up at last minute. So we can start with uh, Mr. Nikolai. Fabulous. So, so can I just check, are we just going to, uh, I've got Arno next. Oh, and so, so we've got somebody different. We have got a uh, Mr. Nikolai, who is the head of the Republic of Saka. Mr. Nikolai, can I ask you to make your contribution? Добрый день, дорогие друзья. Hi. Площадка, организованная ОГМВ, глобальной целевой группой в рамках климатической конференции ООН, безусловно, одна из самых важных, на мой взгляд, в развитии городов и регионов. Последствия глобального изменения климата, конечно же, являются одними из самых масштабных вызовов современности. Россия, как и другие страны, пострадала от негативных последствий глобального потепления. В силу огромной территории Якутия, самый крупный регион России, ее территория 3 миллиона квадратных километров, испытывает на себя последствия из глобальных изменений природы с двукратной силой. Мы ежегодно сейчас сталкиваемся с проблемой огромных лесных пожаров. Лето 2021 года было особо драматичным, потому что была небывалая засуха и аномально жаркая погода, которой никогда не было за историю метеонаблюдений. И у нас на территории произошло почти 1700 лесных пожаров, и лес горел на территории почти 9 миллионов гектаров. Конечно же, как и в других странах, которым угрожают масштабные природные пожары, огонь вплотную приближался к населенным пунктам, что, конечно же, нанесло колоссальный ущерб экологии и здоровью тысяч людей, включая сообщество коренных малочисленных народов, которые населяют Арктику. Безусловно, при этом период этот тяжелый стал временем проявления лучших человеческих качеств. Мы смогли преодолеть эти испытания благодаря единству, Благодаря тому, что десятки тысяч людей на самом деле поднялись на борьбу с этой стихией, с огнем, и каждый стремился внести свой вклад в общее благое дело. И благодаря общей слаженной работе региональных властей, федеральных властей, местных властей, бизнеса, местного населения, добровольцев, мы одержали победу на огне. При этом, конечно же, для меня очевидно, что в будущем угроза подобных катаклизмов будет лишь расти, в Арктике, Арктика сегодня нагревается, согласно экспертизе ООН по климату, вдвое быстрее, чем остальная поверхность Земли. И, конечно же, эти изменения будут приводить к дальнейшему усилению таяния вечной мерзлоты, сокращению ледников в Арктике. Конечно же, здесь надо понимать, что таяние вечной мерзлоты на огромных территориях – это климатическая бомба, потому что будут удваиваться потенциальные выбросы углерода и метана на огромных территориях. Мы сейчас выстраиваем систему охраны лесов от пожаров. Конечно же, будем увеличивать финансирование, нам в этом помогает федеральное правительство. Но, конечно же, есть и вопросы, которые мы должны здесь решать. Ведь мы в Якутии сегодня имеем 30% нетронутой человеком природы в России, и это около 10% нетронутой природы в мире. В связи с этим мы являемся мировым экологическим резерватом, одним из ключевых климатических регуляторов всей планеты. Мы сейчас создаем лесопитомники в Якутии. При помощи федерального правительства также будут создаваться новые лесопитомники, тепличные комплексы для выращивания саженцев в закрытой корневой системы. Безусловно, мы подключаем к борьбе с пожарами и научное сообщество вопросами разработки инновационных технологий, защиты, восстановления экосистем, которые страдают от лесных пожаров, мы будем привлекать наш научный образовательный центр мирового уровня «Север». В целом, я считаю, что борьба с последствиями изменения климата должна 
интегрировать все заинтересованные стороны, включая и гражданское общество. Мы в республике создали совет по благополучию и устойчивому развитию при главе республики, куда я включил не только российских, но и зарубежных руководителей научно-исследовательских школ, руководителей крупнейших промышленных компаний, современных институтов развития. В 2023 году в рамках председательства России в Арктическом совете у нас в Якутии здесь состоится всемирный саммит по вопросам климата и таяния вечной мерзлоты, который, на наш взгляд, тоже будет вносить свой значимый вклад в укрепление международного сотрудничества по климатическим вопросам. Я с удовольствием заранее всех вас, дорогие друзья, приглашаю в Викутс на эту конференцию. Уверен, что ОГМВ примет активное участие в его подготовке, проведению. Конечно же, будет ряд серьезных мероприятий по продвижению ценности и значимости вечной мерзлоты, карелитозоны в общепланетарных масштабах. Уверен, что наши инициативы по борьбе с последствиями изменения климата будут коррелировать с деятельностью ОГМВ, других международных организаций и надеемся, что с помощью вот таких подобных площадок, которые организуются в ГМВ глобальной целевой группой, к ним будет привлечено самое широкое международное внимание и участие. Еще раз благодарю ГМВ, благодарю наших шотландских друзей за организацию сегодняшнего э, саммита и за возможность обменяться мнениями. Большое спасибо и успех. Thank you very much, Mr. Nikolai. A very illuminating. Thank you. A, can I now move to a Rob Metz, the Mayor of Swest in Netherlands, please? Well, thank you very much. Uh, and, and you said about pronunciation, but we have a very good, difficult language. We say it's Soest, and you cannot see it from the words in, unless you speak our difficult language. So thank you very much. Um, well, dear colleagues, um, it's a pleasure to meet all again. And I would like to thank the UCLG World Secretariat for providing us with the opportunity to get together in this hybrid format. It's good that we do not let the pandemic get in the way of convening because of the topics we are discussing here today are of the highest urgency. Climate change and the pandemic are clearly showing the vulnerability of the world we live in. And indeed, this requires multi-level action. This is true both for ensuring inclusive and sustainable recovery and for preparing for crisis and managing crisis. Although the voice of local government is clearly being heard, we rightfully have a seat at the table. These global issues require direct action on the ground as well. Around the world, local governments find themselves at the front lines every day, facing crises that are global in scope, but local in impact. It is our role to make sure these local governments get the support they so urgently need, but in terms of technical capacity or financial means. It is not just a dialogue that needs to be multi-level, it should be action and funding as well. In the Netherlands, national government is increasingly aware that local governments need this support and our dialogue with them has resulted in a new partnership with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. From the 1st of January next year, VNG will be implementing this 50 million euro program aimed at supporting our colleagues abroad in dealing with mass immigration, fragility, and enhancing revenue streams. But we cannot be looking at central governments alone. To support local governments, that should also be multi, a multi-level effort as well. This is where the newly set up Solidarity Fund comes in, through which we as UCLG membership should act in solidarity with those local governments on the front lines of crisis. This first of such solidarity programs have certainly shown their value this year, and I look forward to further building on this collaboration together with you. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And I, I will remember to pronounce it Schust. Is it Schust? Schust. Schust. Schust in Scottish means be quiet. <laughs>
<laughs> so it's close to it. <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, for that contribution. And uh, you're absolutely correct in terms of um, a participation. It's not just talking. It isn't just action, but the funding needs to follow it. Um, it's absolutely crucial. So can I call on our next speaker, who is Martina uh, Otto, from, who's the head of the Cities Unit from UNEP. Martina, can I pass to you, please? Sure, thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks very, very much for this opportunity to, um, well, talk to you about uh, basically uh, an opportunity that we would like to uh, put forward, and that is uh, with regard to Stockholm Plus 50 uh, in June 2022, next year. Uh, the UN uh, will celebrate the 50 years since the 72 Stockholm uh, United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, um, which was really a rallying point to put environment as a pressing global issue um, on the table, on the radar for the first time. And obviously many things have changed uh, since the early 70s and we've made a lot of progress, but while well, we're just witnessing as well that so much still is to be done. And um, the, the, the conference will allow us to, to take stock um, and to help, well, define the vision forward as well. The topic of the conference is a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, our responsibility, our opportunity. The two resolutions um, of the General Assembly that are governing the preparations for this, UNEP is serving as the focal point and there's a whole engagement process that is uh, coming together. What is fixed is that there will be three leadership dialogues, um, a few preparatory meetings uh, with background papers to be developed and so on. I mean, not unlike what uh, what we have seen as a process also for Habitat 3 and other, other of these events. But the three leadership dialogues are, the, the first is reflecting on the urgent need for actions to achieve a healthy planet and prosperity for all. The second is achieving a sustainable and inclusive recovery uh, from COVID. And the third is accelerating the implementation of the environmental dimension of sustainable development in the context of the decade of action. And the idea is really to help through think through some of those pathways to a healthy planet while addressing um, the, the recovery. And uh, what we'd like to uh, propose is a line of debate to discuss um, and address the role that cities and local governments have played um, in promoting the environmental values since 72 to now, and obviously as well an outlook to uh, where that leads us uh, to 2030 and, uh, and beyond. And obviously that is around climate, but also biodiversity and so on. And Emilia said at the outset, well, food, for example, as a, as a new topic, but also as one that can connect uh, between those. So there's a whole range of things that we can look at. And um, we want to offer this opportunity to think through this together um, and to really gather your ideas, your thoughts, what could go in, um, in such a background document from a SAP national perspective, but also how to influence the other three for these leadership dialogues. There is a planned um, session uh, that involves mayors as well that will be hosted by the city of Stockholm. So that's something that Stockholm will talk about um, on, on their own when the time is ripe. But uh, I think there is a unique opportunity to actually look at um, this democratization that we have seen as well in terms of environment is in everybody's minds uh, at, the, at the moment. And we all have to take action. And we have seen so much leadership from the sub-national level. Um, how can we federate that further? And I think it can help bring forward also this debate on the seat at the table uh, that is going on at the moment as well. And, uh, and then maybe as well to unleash the potential in some of the areas um, that we've seen, be it on energy with decentralized energy, where there's a whole democratization as well, where the local level can play a, a really, really strong role in helping to roll them out. And I'm only saying energy, there's something on mobility, there's something on food, as we as we said, so maybe, maybe look through some of those key areas as well. And I just wanted to put out a few ideas, but I'm very much in listening mode and would be really, really delighted to get inputs from you on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martina. And those three themes uh, are so critical for, for all of us, aren't they? They're, they're so interconnected. Uh, and looking at the three of them together, I think is absolutely essential. So thank you uh, for that. Can I now move to Greg Munro, the Director of Cities Alliance, please? Greg. 
Thank you, Sally. It's a nice Scottish name that's easy for you to pronounce. So City Alliance works primarily with, with in urban poverty. And if we're talking about resilient and safe cities, I mean, the alarm bells should really be ringing in terms of, of informality with rapid urbanization, the increase in informal settlements, uh, the climate crisis, and the effect that COVID has had. And you know, one, of the, one of the informal settlements we work in is West Point in Monrovia in Liberia. And I was watching a, an interview with one of the residents this morning. The, the rising sea levels, because it's right on the, on the coast, this informal settlement, and the rising sea levels have encroached 150 meters inland and just wiped away shacks and wiped away shelters. And this woman being interviewed was, it was quite tragic uh, with, with high tide and the rising sea levels where she actually lost one of her own children who drowned with the rising sea levels overnight in, in, in West Point. And this is just going to get worse and worse. And the, the people who, who have contributed the least to climate change are the ones who are the most affected by it. And the urban poor and informality, and if we're going to create resilient cities and safe cities, we need to take the urban poor living in informality with us because they are the most vulnerable. Informal settlements are often most more exposed to climate hazards because they are on, on pieces of land that nobody else wants to live in. They are more vulnerable because of lack of infrastructure and lack of services. They are more vulnerable vulnerable because of that it's compounded by multidimensional poverty. Social exclusion and marginalization reduces the abilities of slum dwellers to influence climate resilience investments that concern them. Unplanned adaptive strategies means that communities often adapt in unsustainable ways like chopping down of trees or firewood. But yet at the same time, if we are to create resilient cities, we also need to listen to people living in inf informality because they are also very resilient themselves. They've had to be resilient because of their multidimensional poverty. And they also create an opportunity for us to help unlock uh, community engagement and community ideas in how we create our resilient cities. But in the work that all of us do, local government and in cities and in, in, in our urban spheres, poverty alleviation, the programming and the financing for poverty alleviation, slum upgrading, climate change, infrastructure finance, they still occupy separate alleys. They're all separate thematic issues that don't talk to each other. And that's one of our great challenges. There are massive opportunities to build climate resilience in our cities and unlock the mitigation potential of our cities by better linking climate and urban upgrade finance. But this requires a dialogue between urban and climate constituencies, as well as an awareness of the opportunities that exist. Now, earlier on in COP, we had a, a climate justice session and it was the clear message out of that session, which I, I think also resonates in this session, is that urban poverty and people living in poverty in our cities are responding to that and responding to the climate crisis have to be integrated. It is one and the same response. Otherwise, we will never ever achieve a good outcome on either the urban poverty, poverty or in the climate crisis. And that's all I really want to say, Sally, because that's really the main message that I want to, to leave here is that we do need to integrate those two if we are to create resilient cities, cities that, are, that, that we include all of our citizens in responding to the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And that absolutely resonates with some of the speakers we heard this morning around a, when there's been an industrial revolution or changes in terms of what the manufacturing base or whatever a, it is, a, if we don't bring citizens with us, I, and it be for all of our citizens, then actually we just create a much more unequal I, world than where we are just now. So thank you for that, Greg. I, I'm now going to move to Taipei. We've got the Director General of the Secretariat, New Taipei City Government. Is it Chingu Yao? 
Can I pass to you? And please forgive my pronunciation. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, so you will control the PowerPoint presentation or should I? Oh, excellent. So um, I would like to share with everyone, everyone that even though we cannot be at uh, COP26, uh, let me adjust the... Even though we cannot be at COP26 uh, physically, but uh, we decided to join uh, COP26 uh, by actions. That is to issue our VOR today in New Taipei. So maybe you can get to the next slide and see a short video of it. So in this video, as you can see, we hope this uh, book is beyond a book from inside out, from the production to presentation to represent New Pai Bay's beliefs in SDGs. That's why we work with uh, designers that are great examples in Taiwan to upcycle, recycle, uh, upcycle resources that otherwise would be treated as waste. Uh, so we use disposable fiber boards. That's this, everyone's in your computer, in your PC, there is a motherboard. And for making each of the computer motherboards, uh, we need to use one disposable fiber board. And we decided to use that as our packaging material. So uh, next slide, please. So in this launching event earlier, uh, we also showed what a journey New Taipei has gone through from VLR1 in 2019 to today's VLR2. Ever since 2019, when we first issued the first VLR, we have made localizing SDGs our city's priority. And our, sit, uh, our mayor also has the great leadership uh, we have successfully raised their awareness in Taiwan. We even won the German's uh, IF Design Award in communications. And now in Taiwan, we're so glad there are six more cities uh, with their own VLRs. And by, I believe there will be soon uh, many more. And now in 2021 today, we are again the first city in Taiwan to issue VLR after the pandemic. The next slide, please. That's why there's a whole chapter in this uh, VLR to cover COVID-19 and the city government's response and uh, how they affected people's lives. Because we really want to contribute this to people who have lost their lives and their families. And there are also some of the highlights I would like to share with you. Uh, for example, next slide. There are 60 best practices from our city collected from 28 different departments of the city government. And these 60 cases are carefully selected to represent public and private partnership and stories of people's daily lives. We try to cover equally all 17 goals 
provided with local challenges and solutions for our global city peers and partners like the event today. And the other highlight, next slide please, is each case is carefully analyzed by the tools that we collaborated with Stockholm Environment Institute. So in each of the story, you will see there's a box. In this box, we have uh, a subject's identification, impact on goals, and also more importantly, impact on between goals. So with some of the goals, it's synergy, and some of the goals, there are trade-offs. And then you will see on each story, on each case, we are also giving it a city index number. That is our new type of cities index numbers. But we pair that index number, our local index numbers, with SDGs 70 goals and their sub goals. So by doing that, we hope we can improve our methodology and provide researchers with more information. Uh, next slide, please. So as I say, uh, uh, this VOR we hope is a testimony of our beliefs and actions in uh, SDGs. Next slide. I would like to uh, also briefly introduce our logo of our uh, new Taipei City's SDG, which is a Chinese character of human. And in this logo, there are eight humans side by side, hand in hand, with the goal 11 in the center, which is the sustainable cities and communities, which means when we move in harmony, guided by SDG, we can bloom like a flower. And if we can find a way, if we work in partnership, this is some of the snapshot we took today. And we're so glad uh, three representatives from, Nor uh, from the Nordic country join with us. And they are the three countries that have the best sustainable performance. And we like to uh, learn from them and also share uh, this video out with all of our city peers and partners. Thank you so much. Thank you, and what an amazing logo. I can see everybody smiling on the screen. Absolutely love it, it's amazing. So we, we've heard from uh, all of our speakers this afternoon. I, I just wonder, given the contributions that everyone's made, do any of our speakers want to come back and make any comments from what you've heard? Shall I start with Mr. Nikolai? Is there anything you would like to add? Спасибо. Я еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, что вот те проблемы, которые сегодня есть у нас у разных регионов мира, они на самом деле нас должны объединять, а не разъединять. К сожалению, очень часто бывает так, что страны пытаются оградиться, территории пытаются оградиться, но проблемы, которые возникают с изменением климата, мы создаем их все вместе как человечество, и решать мы их должны все вместе как человечество. Поэтому я призываю своих коллег тоже всем вместе работать по этой теме. Вместе мы только сможем победить эту проблему. Каждый по отдельности не спасется. Well said. Absolutely well said. We can learn from each other, both in terms of what works really well, but also where things have not worked. Uh, because if, if we share what hasn't worked, then it will save other people from making the same mistakes. And I think that's equally as important. So thank you. Any of the other speakers? Well, maybe I would, I would like to underline uh, actually what was said, because all the contributions were very nice, uh, because they all gave a different view on the same, uh, on, on the same issue. We do have to work within every angle of uh, of this aspect, and uh, and I really do like the the contributions from all locals because the, I think local policies are more practical than national policies, and the 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 problems can only be solved local 
if we work together. So that's the underlining of the former speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Martina, do you want to add anything? No. Sorry, I'm working on two screens and the mouse didn't want to move over. So there we go. Um, no, I think uh, what is coming out very clearly is, is that leadership role, but also this people-centeredness and uh, the local levels being really the connecting point to people. And if I take it back to the, the objectives with the Stockholm Plus 50, thinking responsibility. So what, what's new? It's actually, now that we've learned that it's so important, it's for all of us to do something about it. And I think here the connecting point really is at the local level. And I think a lot of the solutions can be brought to scale thanks to that level. So I'd be really, really looking forward to, to working that out uh, together a, a little more to bring a very strong message um, and to actually help support local governments um, with the big task. Because we all say that it's huge. You're on the front line, but, uh, but then the means often don't follow suit. And how can we help unblock that a little further? So I think there's a, a story to be told <laughs> over from my yeah. side. Thank you. And how powerful we would be if we all came together with that ask, wouldn't we? So you probably worked out, Greg, I'm going to come to you next to ask if you've got any further observations. Um, I, I think I think the, the logo on the last slide from Taipei has, has, has made us all say the same thing because we all like that logo so much of that togetherness and those eight people together. And uh, so, so yes, I mean, we, we've been saying it that we, we need to do this together, but it just, you know, I won't say who, but one of one of one of the previous heads of state said to me a little while ago that the most important SDG, if she had to choose one, it would be seventeen, because it's that partnership of, of revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable development that's going to make this happen. And that doesn't just mean, for me, that doesn't just mean the partnership at a UN and multilateral and, and national government level. It's got to include our citizens at a very tangible, tangible level. And, and the big challenge to all of us, we can say, oh, we want to work together and we're going to have SDG 17 and have these nice logos. But the big challenge is how do we get the finance? Not just from global north to global south, but from from national governments to city governments and to local governments. And then within city governments, how do we get the finance from, from out of the coffers of the municipality into the informal settlements and the people who are most at risk? And that's the big challenge that we have going forward. And that we have to work together on fixing that. Thank you, Greg, very wise words there. So is it Ching Yu? Can I come to you? Yes, thank you. Thank you for loving that um, uh, logo. I think there are two hard earned lessons from uh, the pandemic and we should not forget these hard earned lessons. One is that uh, during the pandemic, I think uh, there are many divergence and differences between how to uh, control the pandemic between uh, city government and local governments. And I think in most of the time, city leader chose to stand alongside with their citizens. And I believe a city leaders' uh, roles are rising greatly and are becoming more important than ever uh, after the pandemic. And secondly is partnership. I would like to echo everyone. If we really work together, just by looking at how vaccine has been developed, donated and distributed. The world can overcome any uh, challenges if we work on the same goal together. And that should apply to climate change and that should apply to um, SDG as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to uh, all the speakers. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to uh, for days, and I'm, I'm not even going to attempt to say your surname, so please forgive me, who's a special advisor of the UCLG uh, Secretary General. Forgive me, please. 
No, please, Sally. Uh, it's not as easy as yours, <laughs> and, and I'm fully, fully aware and uh, and used to it. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful moderation, Sally, and thank you also to Kosla for all the wonderful work uh, they did as the local support in organizing for all the LGMA and all the Global Tax Force uh, constituency, the work uh, here in the COP26, and welcome all. We are here live from the COP26. You see people <laughs> going behind, moving all around. Um, this has been an amazing day up, to, up until now and an amazing cup with the uh, surprises, good and, and less good. Uh, but uh, it is true that um, the negotiations uh, are still ongoing and are being quite hard. And it is quite amazing to see that the role of the local government is still to be made manifested and not being an evidence for, for all the for all the national governments. But fortunately, the, the words and actions from the United Nations Secretary General this morning are bringing uh, a true hope. Uh, this is about the future generations, about their territories, their livelihoods, and the transformation that citizens are requesting for the planet, the way we want to live together. Uh, and it is also about our patterns of life and how we unfold culture into our daily, daily life. So the next panel is allowing us to go through these different views, linking it with specific experiences. And uh, without further delay, I would like to invite Corinne Lepage, uh, ex-president and uh, ex-minister, sorry, and president of the Association of France of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Madame Lepage, Madame le Ministre, à vous la parole. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je voudrais tout d'abord euh, remercier Madame Seyss et CGLU de me donner euh, l'occasion de pouvoir vous parler à nouveau de la Déclaration universelle, non pas des droits de l'homme, euh, mais euh, des droits euh, de l'humanité. Je rappelle que cette déclaration a été signée par CGLU à Durban en 2019 et grâce au travail de votre bureau politique et notamment de Madame la secrétaire générale, euh, ce texte fait maintenant partie intégrante de la stratégie euh, de euh, CGLU. Vous venez de parler de partenariat, vous venez de parler de l'ODD 17. La Déclaration universelle des droits de l'humanité, c'est aujourd'hui probablement le seul texte qui existe, signé à la fois par des entités publiques, comme vous-même, euh, comme l'Association internationale des mères francophones, par exemple, ou les parlementaires de la Méditerranée, et énormément euh, d'organisations non gouvernementales, plus de 60, des universités, de très nombreux barreaux, euh, des entreprises et beaucoup, beaucoup de particuliers. Donc, c'est vraiment un exemple de euh, partenariat. L'intérêt de la déclaration euh, se euh, retrouve dans le travail que vous menez vous-même à travers euh, la charte Agenda des droits humains de la ville et dans le pacte pour l'avenir. Je les ai lus attentivement et j'ai bien vu que les euh, principes qui inspirent la déclaration sont exactement euh, les mêmes. Quatre principes, responsabilité, dignité de l'humanité qui intègre le droit au développement, équité intergénérationnelle, pérennité du vivant. Six droits, et c'est très important pour les sujets dont nous parlons aujourd'hui avec la COP26, six devoirs. Parce qu'il ne peut y avoir de droits sans de, des devoirs, et que le devoir de l'humanité aujourd'hui, c'est de se sauver, et de sauver, non pas la planète, mais de sauver le vivant. Et donc, l'importance des devoirs à équité, à équilibre avec les droits, est quelque chose de tout à fait fondamental. Qu'est-ce que l'on retrouve dans la déclaration Eh bien, des éléments qui sont les vôtres. Le climat et les réfugiés, l'accès aux ressources et leur préservation, la paix, la gestion du progrès technologique dans le sens de l'intérêt de l'humanité, l'usage des biens communs, les rapports entre la nature et l'humanité. Les quatre principes fondamentaux que j'ai rappelés tout à l'heure sont au cœur des sujets de la COP26 et des euh, politiques à mettre en place. La reconnaissance des devoirs, j'y reviens, mais c'est vraiment fondamental, la reconnaissance des devoirs est une absolue nécessité. On ne justifie pas, euh, sans se référer aux devoirs, les principes de responsabilité, la responsabilité partagée et équitable entre les pays, euh, les milliards nécessaires pour l'adaptation, tout cela se réfère et aux notions de responsabilité et aux notions d'obligation. 
Ce sont également, euh, mesdames et messieurs les élus, ces principes que l'on retrouve dans le troisième considérant de la décision proposée par la présidence, euh, qui ne vise pas expressément la déclaration, mais euh, qui vise expressément tous les principes qui y figurent, et peut-être, c'est une suggestion que je fais à la présidence, peut-être une référence plus explicite. Et puis, euh, ce que je voudrais vous dire à vous, élus, qui êtes au premier rang, de toutes les difficultés auxquelles nous, humains, sommes confrontés, euh, de, de développement, euh, d'équité, euh, le climat, la santé, l'alimentation, les déchets, euh, l'industrialisation, la réponse aux besoins, tout cela, euh, ce sont des éléments qui, pour vous, sont absolument euh, euh, essentiels et c'est ce que la déclaration permet précisément de, euh, de contenir dans un texte unique, et c'est cela probablement son intérêt, ce n'est pas un texte génial, mais il a l'avantage d'exister, d'être déjà signé par beaucoup, et de se référer à tout ce qui est absolument indispensable pour pouvoir ensuite décliner tout le reste. L'année 2022, vous l'avez rappelé, c'est une année très importante. C'est 30 ans après Rio, c'est 50 ans après Stockholm. C'est pour cela que euh, tous les, beaucoup euh, des euh, personnes qui soutiennent la déclaration ont décidé de lancer une coalition euh, 2022, des DHU 2022, et notamment euh, ce sont les organisations non gouvernementales, membres euh, d'ECOSOC et signataires de la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'humanité qui ont pris euh, cette initiative. Faire de la DDHU un texte universellement reconnu pour le 30e anniversaire de Rio, pour le 50e anniversaire de Stockholm. Tout simplement parce que c'est une base, ce n'est qu'une déclaration, avec toute la souplesse qui va avec la déclaration, mais c'est une base qui permet ensuite de fonder toutes les exigences, tous les droits et toutes les politiques qu'il convient de mettre en place. Je remercie encore une fois Madame Seyss de m'avoir donné l'occasion de m'exprimer devant vous. Merci, merci, Madame Lepage. Nous gardons effectivement ce, ce message fort et nous le portons comme une, un axe structurel de la narrative de CGLU sur les, 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 les droits des futures générations à vivre une planète vivable. Et effectivement, le dialogue intergénérationnel, l'équité, l'équité sociale, l'équité climatique, l'équité dans les, dans les droits et dans les responsabilités, car il s'agit de prendre nos responsabilités tous comme une communauté mondiale euh, et face au climat également. Merci bien pour cette intervention, Madame Lepage. Nous reviendrons vers vous euh, dans, un, dans un deuxième temps. Je, uh, I would like now to invite uh, Madame uh, Véronique Lamontagne, Director of the International Relations Office uh, from the General Direction of Montréal, Canada. Please, the floor is yours. Bonjour à tous, c'est vraiment un plaisir d'être avec vous ce matin à la COP26 virtuellement. J'y étais la semaine précédente en, en présentiel, donc je salue tout le monde qui, qui a pu s'y rendre et euh, tout le monde qui se retrouve avec nous aujourd'hui. Je vais être brève euh, sur le propos d'aujourd'hui. Je pense qu'il est intéressant de dire que euh, les villes, tout en gérant l'urgence, ont vraiment euh, pris un moment pour aussi penser l'avenir. Si on regarde attentivement les travaux qui ont été faits pendant euh, la période pandémique, euh, c'est-à-dire l'agenda des maires du C40 pour une relance verte et inclusive, le plaidoyer du U20 qui a été présenté aux dirigeants du G20, si on regarde les résultats des travaux menés par CGLU, je pense que force est de constater que tous les éléments d'un pacte pour le futur s'y retrouvent non seulement en mots, mais en action. Les villes sont déjà en action. Elles ont vite fait de constater qu'elle faisait face à plusieurs crises. Évidemment, une crise sanitaire, comme l'ont dit les collègues précédemment, une crise sanitaire, mais une crise aussi qui est venue exacerber euh, les inégalités, une crise qui est venue euh, aussi nous rappeler l'urgence climatique et euh, aussi les enjeux économiques, euh, tous les enjeux aussi de, liés à la finance durable et au renouvellement de, notre, de nos façons de faire en termes économiques. Euh, les villes ont su vite euh, prendre des engagements et démontrer leur euh, détermination à agir, à prendre des actions pour la planète, le climat, pour euh, toutes les questions liées aux personnes, l'inclusion, le respect des droits, toutes les questions économiques. À l'instar de plusieurs villes du monde, Montréal s'est vite engagé dans une relance verte et inclusive. On en a fait 
Euh, on a affirmé euh, très rapidement notre engagement à aller dans ce sens-là. Euh, et euh, je crois que tous les thèmes, personne, planète, prospérité, sont des thèmes intimement liés à l'action des villes euh, qui résonnent très fort euh, dans nos villes et dans ma ville. Euh, la Ville de Montréal, localement, euh, a mis en place un plan stratégique qui retient comme objectif la résilience face aux enjeux actuels et aux enjeux futurs. Il retient quatre orientations. Les deux premières, l'accélération de la transition écologique, euh, qui est un, un enjeu qui est repris par plusieurs villes euh, pères, et euh, toute la question de la solidarité, l'équité, l'inclusion, qui ne peuvent se faire, comme l'ont dit aussi euh, mes collègues précédemment, sans une participation citoyenne, sans innovation et sans créativité. On doit absolument euh, s'assurer d'une participation citoyenne pour y arriver et euh, aussi d'une action multipartite. Euh, si on regarde concrètement les actions qui sont faites par les villes, sur, en lien avec la planète et le climat, je pense qu'on peut dire que les villes jouent, jouaient déjà et jouent un rôle renouvelé et encore euh, ont démontré leur intérêt à accélérer leurs actions en matière climatique. Euh, je pense que ça, ça a été démontré auparavant, mais ça se démontre aussi assez clairement dans toutes les actions qui ont été prises au cours euh, des derniers jours à la COP. Euh, donc, vraiment, euh, il apparaît très clairement que les villes sont la voie vers un avenir vert, juste, prospère. Puis que ça commence par des investissements dans les villes du monde entier puis des actions concrètes dans les villes du monde entier. Euh, Montréal agit évidemment sur différents points. Puis je ne ferai pas l'énumération de tout ce qu'on fait, mais on agit sur le verdissement, euh, sur euh, la gestion des matières résiduelles, euh, sur euh, la réduction des GES, euh, la mobilité. Euh, sur toute la question de la prospérité, je pense qu'il y a un devoir des villes de travailler ensemble, mais pas seules, avec d'autres partenaires, pour favoriser une prospérité renouvelée. Je pense que euh, le signal est clair qu'on ne peut pas euh, avoir un, faire un retour en arrière. Il faut vraiment euh, s'engager dans une reprise, une relance qui laisse personne derrière. Puis, il faut vraiment favoriser une prospérité qui est vraiment qui profite à tous en appuyant des mesures comme on le fait à Montréal, d'économie circulaire, d'achat responsable, euh, puis de favoriser des emplois, un virage vers des emplois euh, verts qui peuvent euh, vraiment assurer une prospérité aussi à nos citoyens. Sur le plan des personnes, euh, on le dit, cette crise a touché les inégalités. Les villes agissent beaucoup en matière d'habitation, de lutte contre les discriminations. On le fait à Montréal. Je pense qu'il y a beaucoup d'efforts qui ont été faits. Il y a beaucoup d'efforts qui sont engagés. Mais il reste encore beaucoup à faire et l'un des principaux défis a été nommé aussi ce matin, c'est le défi de lier ces enjeux-là, de ne pas les traiter en silo, en segments. Il faut vraiment être capable de voir les liens entre climat et immigration, entre climat et finances durables, entre, entre inégalités euh, et aussi nos actions qu'on mène euh, en, en matière de, économique et euh, climatique. Euh, un autre de nos défis aussi, c'est vraiment d'aller vers des actions multipartites. On a fait beaucoup d'efforts dans les dernières années pour collaborer entre villes. Euh, on a déployé des efforts aussi pour euh, collaborer avec d'autres, mais il faut les multiplier. On ne peut pas agir seul. Et euh, je ressouligne encore une, une fois l'importance d'agir pour les villes à la fois localement, à la fois au niveau national et international, parce que notre action nationale, internationale prend aucun sens si on ne le connecte pas sur ce qu'on fait localement. Donc, une action vraiment à tous les niveaux euh, est essentielle. Je m'arrête ici. Merci. Thank you so much, Madame La Montagne, for this uh, for this intervention. This is clear that it is true we have all the elements for for a pact for the future. The question is how to gather them and how to ensure that it is reliable and connecting the local and the global, which is the aim of the whole pact. Um, for the future. Thank you so much. And I also keep uh, the question of, of the recovery through a transversal agenda uh, of, of, of climate in, in the local policies. Uh, we cannot have different policies without having a, a perspective, a green perspective transversal through all the, through all the different uh, public policies at local level. Thank you so much. I would like now to invite Francisco Mugaburru, uh, Deputy Director of International Relations and Cooperation from the Union of Ibero-American Capital Cities. Francisco, a ti la palabra. Muchas gracias, Firdaus. Eh, bueno, eh, muy buenas tardes. Ante todo, quiero saludarlos en nombre de nuestra Secretaria General, Almudena Maillo y Ana Román, nuestra Directora General, que hoy 
no han podido estar presentes. Es un gusto estar aquí. Quisiera agradecer a Emilia Sáez y a todo el equipo de CGRU por el espacio que le brindan a la UCI como miembro del Consejo Político sobre Ciudades Más Seguras, Resilientes, Sostenibles y Capaces de Enfrentar la Crisis, de cual somos parte y nuestra Secretaria General es consejera. Un ámbito clave de encuentro y reflexión entre todos en este importante día que nos convoca en el marco de nada más ni nada menos que la COP26. En el complejo escenario en el que nos encontramos, nos ha quedado claro que los gobiernos locales se encuentran en primera línea, atendiendo a las demandas más urgentes de sus ciudadanos y a su vez que los desafíos globales requieren de respuestas innovadoras, llevadas adelante en conjunto. La cooperación más que nunca debe ser estrategia y el instrumento que debemos potenciar, así como el fortalecimiento de los espacios de colaboración en red, la generación y promoción de alianzas que sean efectivas y sostenibles. En UCSI, la Unión de Ciudades Capitales Iberoamericanas, venimos de celebrar exitosamente la semana pasada la decimonovena Asamblea General, contando con la presencia de la mayoría de los alcaldes y representantes de las capitales iberoamericanas. Asimismo, participó Emilia Saiz, Secretaria General de CGRU, aquí presente, a quien quiero agradecer un, su valioso apoyo y el mensaje transmitido sobre la importancia de desarrollar un pacto para el futuro de gran alcance. Quisiera destacar resumidamente que los intercambios de visiones y pronunciaciones y pronunciamientos de los alcaldes y representantes se han centrado en un denominador común, la importancia de la cooperación y el intercambio de conocimientos y experiencias propias entre nuestras ciudades como estrategia clave para enfrentar la crisis climática que estamos enfrentando y el futuro de la pospandemia. Por primera vez, desde UCSI hemos aprobado una estrategia para los próximos cuatro años, donde se establecen las principales líneas de trabajo centradas en la innovación y la sostenibilidad. En esta misma línea, estamos trabajando durante estos dos años, hemos estado trabajando durante estos dos años apoyando las necesidades más urgentes de nuestras ciudades. Durante el 2021 implementamos 17 proyectos de cooperación técnica en sectores prioritarios enmarcados en las metas de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. En materia de resiliencia climática, por ejemplo, con Buenos Aires estamos liderando un proyecto clave sobre políticas públicas, estratégicas participativas y sensibilización para la agenda climática a nivel local de la mano de ICLEI uno de nuestros socios estratégicos. Este proyecto es una apuesta a los esfuerzos de nuestras ciudades por convertirse en territorios resilientes, inclusivos y carbono neutral, priorizando el conocimiento y el apoyo clave de las alianzas estratégicas. Junto con la OMT, como todos ustedes saben, y a lo largo de todo este año hemos venido pregonando la Estrategia Iberoamericana del Turismo del Futuro, pensada como una herramienta de recuperación económica del sector, junto a CGLU y a la Unión Internacional del Transporte Público. También quiero mencionar el proyecto que estamos liderando con Lima, junto a UN Habitat, sobre población migrante venezolana en la capital del Perú, o con Sao Paulo, que estamos llevando adelante la estrategia para monitorear y evaluar los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en los gobiernos locales, junto con Buenos Aires y Ciudad de México. Para finalizar, quisiera transmitir el interés de la Unión de Ciudades Capitales Iberoamericanas en fortalecer estos procesos de debate y reflexión para inspirar a nuestros gobiernos locales a la hora de tomar decisiones sobre medidas urgentes que nos demandan las agendas globales de hoy para construir ciudades más resilientes, sostenibles, que necesitamos para el futuro. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Francisco. Es un hecho que las redes están, en, en, entre otras, para inspirar uh, y ayudar a los, a los gobiernos locales a tomar las buenas decisiones eh, a nivel local y que impacten a nivel eh, nacional y, y global. Muchísimas gracias, Francisco. Here I am. Sorry. I would like now to invite uh, a friend Uh, but also uh, the, the director of uh, the Climate Heritage Network. I was at the beginning talking about culture and the impact of culture in our daily life and the link between climate and culture. Uh, Andrew Potts, the floor is yours. Please tell us about that. Well, th thank you, Ferdas. I'm, I'm going to speak in English. Um, uh, as Ferdas said, my name is Andrew Potts and I'm the coordinator of the Climate Heritage Network. The Climate Heritage Network is a global network of organizations focused on the cultural dimensions of the climate emergency. We have a diverse membership. It includes cultural institutions, civil society, creative industries, but also many, many uh, local and regional government members. Uh, in fact, three of our five uh, global co-chairs come from local and regional government. And I especially want to thank United Cities and local governments, UCLG, for being one of the founders of our network. 
I'm speaking to you from COP26 in Glasgow, where we have a 12 member uh, delegation representing the CHN, which I'm happy to say includes one mayor, uh, Mayor Pedro Palacios from Cuenca, Ecuador, as well as a representative of local government and two representatives from regional government. We're here to talk about the cultural dimensions of the twin climate and biodiversity crises and the need to scale out culture based solutions and to mobilize the culture sector for climate action. I firmly believe that there is no pathway to keeping the Paris Agreement's goal of holding global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. There's no pathway to that goal that does not include taking account of the cultural dimensions of the climate emergency. Culture informs the consumption and production patterns of our citizens. It moderate, modulates perceptions of risk and the acceptability of systems change. It provides knowledge about how society has adapted to past crises, and it contributes to the social cohesion and sense of ambition that are essential to transformative action. So I said that there was no pathway to keeping warming below 1.5 degrees that did not address culture. There is also no pathway to 1.5 degrees that does not involve tackling poverty, inequality, and the universal aspiration for sustainable development. The world can simply no longer afford divergent and even conflicting development and climate action agendas. We know that culture is a fourth pillar of sustainable development. And I'm proud to say that here at COP26 in Glasgow, United Cities and local governments launched a new report uh, a report addressing the cultural dimensions of climate resilient development. We launched that report in the multi-level action pavilion. And so thank you to COSLA and UCLG and ICLEI and the others who made that event possible. In the report, we talk about the role of culture in combining these two agendas in addressing transformative decarbonization and adaptation and preparing for loss and damage in ways that also improve the health and well-being, uh, equity and fairness of communities. And a big thanks to the Culture Committee and Jordi Pasquale and his team for ensuring the production of that report in time for COP26. The report includes over 30 case studies, examples of culture-based strategies for achieving climate resilient development. Many are drawn from local and regional governments and UCLG members. Thank, thank you to those who contributed case studies. Let me just close by observing that from those case studies, we see that the nexus between culture, transformative climate action, locally led action and cities and regions is very, very strong. It underscores the critical need for um, local actors and local authorities to be attuned to these cultural dimensions. And that is why we prize so much our relationship with UCLG and with its members at the Climate Heritage Network. And I thank you for allowing me to be a part of your meeting. Thank you, Andrew. We, we in UCLG, we have strong belief that uh, culture is part and a driver, a motor for the transformation to be done for climate and for the ecological transformation that we need for the planet today. Thank you so much. And I see that you have the Scottish, Scottish uh, puppy <laughs> that is celebrating the, the, uh, celebrating the peace of the, uh, of the war. Uh, I would like to, to recall, as, as, you, as uh, most of you know, this is the second part of the local regional government day. The first part was in person here in the COP. And I would like to recall what the minister uh, of the net zero, the Scottish, Scottish ne uh, minister of the net zero said this morning, saying the last century was the century of nations. Uh, and uh, we had two world wars. And this century is uh, the century of cities and we are engaged, the cities are engaged and, and promising and taking their responsibility. I would like to, to, to go for a second round uh, with all the speakers. Uh, and I would like to begin with Madame Lepage saying, how do you feel that the cities could really bring this added value um, 
to implementing the Declaration for Humanity and bring it uh, one step further, uh, talking about climate and ecological transformation. Alors, je pense que les villes peuvent faire énormément. Euh, et je voudrais juste dire que j'étais passionnée par ce que je viens d'entendre sur la culture, parce que je pense que c'est tout à fait fondamental et que nous ne réussirons pas la transition ou transformation, euh, appelez-le comme vous voulez, que nous avons à faire en si peu de temps, qui sera probablement assez brutale et violente, sans faire un effort sans précédent sur tout ce qui est la culture et l'acceptabilité. C'est absolument fondamental, c'est la clé de voûte de tout le reste. Alors maintenant, pour répondre à votre question, c'est un travail auquel je me suis livrée et euh, CGLU a sa, en sa possession un petit document euh, que j'avais fait pour expliquer article par article ce que cela signifiait pour les villes, ce que ça signifiait au niveau des biens communs, ce que cela signifiait au niveau des, des ressources, ce que ça signifiait au niveau euh, de, des, des réfugiés, ce que cela signifiait sur tous les points euh, qui sont abordés parce que je pense que de même que euh, la, la déclaration en fait traduit sur un plan je dirais ju juridique et peut-être un, un degré au-dessus dans l'abstraction euh, les ODD, euh, de même euh, on trouve euh, toutes les politiques publiques qui sont en fait impactées euh, par les propositions de la déclaration tant vues sous le plan des droits que sous ceux des devoirs les villes ayant et des droits à l'égard notamment euh, euh, des États ou des entreprises et des devoirs vis-à-vis euh, -vis des autres et vis-à-vis -vis de leur population parce que nous sommes tous humains à avoir des droits et des devoirs. Et je crois que cette liaison entre les deux est essentielle comme est essentiel le fait de sortir des politiques de silos dont vous avez parlé tout à l'heure parce que c'est absolument fondamental et que si on ne lit pas la question climatique, la question de biodiversité, la question de santé, avec tous les sujets publics habituels, euh, eh bien, il est clair que nous n'y arriverons pas. Merci bien, Madame Lepage. Merci. Madame Lamontagne, euh, je vous laisse réagir à ce qui a été dit jusqu'à présent et peut-être aussi faire un lien entre la récupération, cette fameuse récupération verte et juste, euh, mais également comment est-ce que démontrer que les villes, dans, dans le cadre du pacte pour le futur, euh, démontrer que les villes, euh, mais la, la, non seulement la mènent, mais sont la, la voie nécessaire pour ce faire. Euh, D'abord, en réaction à, à certains propos là, qui ont été émis euh, sur la, la déclaration euh, euh, des droits à l'humanité, c'est le rôle des villes. Je pense que le rôle des villes est beaucoup dans l'action, dans la, dans la mise en en action concrète de certains des éléments de la déclaration, plus que dans la recherche de reconnaissance juridique. Euh, je, je, vraiment, on, on voit que les villes ont moins tendance à, à, à mettre l'énergie et le temps pour une reconnaissance juridique, mais sont dans l'action. Euh, sur le, la culture, oui, je, aussi, c'est vrai que c'est quelque chose qui est vraiment euh, essentiel puis qu'on oublie souvent de mentionner dans l'équation, mais qui est vraiment fondamental. Euh, sur, euh, concernant le collègue de, de, de l'Amérique latine, moi, je pense qu'il faut aussi euh, euh, accroître les liens euh, sur le pôle nord-sud des Amériques. On travaille beaucoup, euh, je ne sais pas d'un point de vue montréalais, on travaille beaucoup avec les villes de l'Europe, les villes euh, aussi la, latino-américaines, mais je pense qu'il y aurait vraiment quelque chose d'intéressant à faire sur l'axe nord-sud, notamment en matière de climat et migration, de renforcer euh, le, ce que font les villes et, et nos, nos interactions, notamment sur ce sujet-là. Je pense qu'il y a quelque chose de vraiment intéressant à poursuivre. Puis je serais intéressée de, de poursuivre la discussion avec, avec votre organisation. Euh, sur la question d'une relance verte et inclusive, je pense que est-ce que, est que les villes sont la, les, 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 bonnes, les bons acteurs pour porter cette relance-là? Je pense que oui. Puis on a un exemple très concret. Euh, les villes ont porté ce message d'une relance verte et inclusive, notamment à travers le U20. Euh, euh, ils sont, on est allé, nos maires sont allés euh, dialoguer avec les dirigeants du G20. Et si on regarde la déclaration du G20, on peut voir euh, vraiment un paragraphe qui, qui s'intitule euh, « Économie circulaire », mais dans lequel on, on reconnaît que les villes sont des « enablers for sustainable development ». Donc, c'est vraiment quelque chose d'important. Puis, la déclaration retient plusieurs éléments d'une relance verte et inclusive. 
Donc, j'aime à penser qu'on a eu une certaine influence en tant que ville sur euh, l'agenda de des dirigeants euh, du G20. Donc, oui, je pense qu'on est les bons acteurs pour porter cette voix-là parce qu'on la porte avec des, avec des actions concrètes qu'on est capable de démontrer. Donc, certes, nous sommes les bons acteurs. Il faut poursuivre cette, euh, ce plaidoyer pour une relance verte et inclusive. Thank you so much, Madame La Montagne. Thank you for, for these uh, reactions, uh, Francisco. Um, creo que ese diálogo norte-sur del que ha estado hablando Madame La Montagne es muy importante en el marco de la UCI también, porque estáis llevando ese diálogo como, como, un, como un eje fundamental de trabajo que estáis haciendo también. Eh, ¿Qué reacciones tendrías a lo que ha sido dicho hasta ahora? Bueno, efectivamente, mientras hablaba eh, la colega pensaba, ¿no? De, específicamente en, esta, en, en lo que fue todo el 2021 en la UCI estamos generando, eh, no lo vemos tanto como norte o sur, sino como Iberoamérica, ¿no? pero es esa, ese esquema de ciudad promotora, su día asociada, que transmite eh, y comparte el conocimiento y también la idea que nosotros eh, tenemos en el corazón, digamos, de la UCI es que se puedan compartir experiencias exitosas y que las ciudades aprendan entre ellas, obviamente coordinando y obviamente en alianza, pero no quiero que quede como algo vacío, digamos, que siempre escuchamos decir, entonces, lo estamos haciendo, lo estamos haciendo con CGLU, lo estamos haciendo con la OMT, lo estamos haciendo con ICLE y con proyectos concretos, con proyectos que se pueden palpar, en alianza público-privada, con ONGs, en El Salvador, en Argentina, en Brasil, eh, siempre como meta, o sea, como, como directriz, la Agenda 2030, los 17 ODS, o sea, y en el 2022 lo vamos a hacer aún con más fuerza y, y, y sumando aún más ciudades. Somos 29 ciudades, pero cada vez con más aliados. Y, y obviamente aprovecho para agradecer a CGLU porque este año hemos trabajado muchísimo. Sí, es verdad que este año hemos trabajado muchísimo y también ha sido, uh, yo lo llamaría como un... un, un en el on, un, una llamada a solidaridad, ¿no? que, que hemos, eh, hemos visto la, cómo el COVID ha, ha, ha dejado ver todas las, las desigualdades, perdona, las desigualdades ¿no? que, que hay por el mundo que mm, las, las dejó ver de manera muy fuerte. Muchas gracias. Eh, Andrew, please, your reactions to what has been said before you and, uh, and also the link to the dialogue where culture has a, a key role to play. Yes, when, when we launched the um, culture and climate resilient development report at COP26 in the multi-level action pavilion, we were lucky to have Mayor Tunch Sawyer of Izmir, Turkey join us in person. And Mayor Sawyer made remarks about what he calls circular culture. And the, the remarks were quite inspiring and it, it made me realize It's been 200 years since the advent, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Fossil fuel economies, make, take, waste ways of doing things are deeply embedded in our culture now, what people sometimes call petroscapes. And so how can culture and heritage help now? Uh, cultural heritage, it reminds us of pre-carbon ways of living. We have cultures around the world who have never bought into the make take waste economy and they have lessons for us. Artists and creative types can help us envision what is living like in a post carbon world. And so these are the contributions I think of arts, culture and heritage to help us imagine what does it look like when we transcend these petroscapes and have a new climate resilient, low carbon way of living. Excellent, Andrew. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to the four speakers. I, I, I have some uh, three, four key, key words, uh, key ideas I would like to keep uh, from all the, 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 the exchanges we had. First is about putting the cities put in, mo in motion, in action. So we talk about project, we talk about legal frame, we can talk about different, uh, different initiatives. The cities engagement, this is Well, we are talking about the political engagement uh, and I think it has been manifested and, and clear and also the enabling conditions uh, for achievement of, of the, the goals that we are seeking uh, as, a global, as a global community. 
Uh, I don't know if any of, of you or from the first panel would like to come back and give two recommendations that they feel for this policy council should be key to keep in the packs for the future. Please. No, even from the first uh, from the first panel. Sally, you have been moderating, but maybe you have an idea <laughs> to bring on what you have been hearing on the two panels. So I, I, I think there's a, a key bit about sharing, Sh sharing a, what has been positive, but also sharing our failures. I think if we could um, we could gather all of those examples, I think that would be good. I agree. I agree. I totally agree. Someone else would like to take the floor from the first panel uh, after listening to the second panel? Well, maybe. Um, Please. For, very short. I think the, the, the key objective is the same everywhere. The, 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 where we come from is a different uh, area, but we should work together. We should share experiences, positive or negative, and um, we should work multi multilateral uh, and multi-level, actually, uh, because it's the only way to to give uh, some uh, solid to to give words and to give more than words to solidarity. It's it's important that we get to get working together, not only talking together. So uh, we should work all at a local level, all from the different angles and share all these angles in order to get to make the progress we need to be make. Absolutely, absolutely. Indeed, one of the key words that that are being shared here in the COP is the articulation of the different efforts. The question is not anymore bringing everyone together, but once we are together, how do we articulate and ensure that there is a synchronization and an articulation coordination of the efforts to make them more efficient and accelerative? Uh, how to thank make you. it practical. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, to make it more practical. Um, anyone who would like to come back on what has been listened from the first panel? If not, uh, we will be opening the floor uh, to the audience. Uh, I know we have some um, key friends and people there. Please, the floor is yours. Please raise your hand, your virtual hand, so that we can see you. OK, I think I'll be going straight <laughs> to the people I will be inviting. Simone, please, um, you are a, a big uh, expert in terms of uh, crisis and in terms of different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, disasters that have been happening and, and working along to, to ensure that there is a support to the local government. Uh, how do you see the, the experience you have been having up until now with this emergency crisis that we are climate one that we are that we are dealing with and we all know that the the sanitary crisis the health crisis has been have been coming because of the of the lack of uh, of uh, of the, because of the of the climate crisis as well it is a consequence a first consequence uh, thank you for that yeah uh, I think that I would like to start saying one word I, I heard some part of the Glasgow comments, but I see. I, I think that uh, uh, we, we should strong our connection with the civil society and the citizen, because I, I think that uh, uh, what is happening now in Glasgow show that uh, outside of the palace, uh, <laughs> there are people that are really pushing uh, um, us to, uh, to take the, their voice to, to the top, because they are clearly not satisfied with the results uh, until now. And uh, I think that we, we should, as a uh, local authority community, to, to support that. And uh, concretely, uh, the little we could do in the behavior of our Solidarity Fund to, to, to help uh, uh, our members, uh, local authority, to support the citizen is a clear example. It is very specific because uh, 
it concerns uh, a situation where uh, there is a major crisis and uh, so um, our intervention is more to, uh, to, to reinforce the, the capacity of the local authorities to, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to help their own uh, population. So, uh, but it's very, uh, it shows us uh, the local authorities are really close to the people actually. And we, we should really uh, keep in mind that uh, reinforce the local authority capacity means uh, uh, reinforce directly uh, the the living uh, condition of the of, of the people, and uh, is what uh, what we are doing together with the, the group, the crisis group in USLG, is just to to show the example. Even in a crisis, in a major crisis, the local authorities are in the front, and helping them means uh, um, give a, a strong contribution to uh, to reinforcement of the local governments uh, governance. Uh, so it's my we are running uh, some uh, uh, some um, pilot experience in several parts of the world. Once is uh, directly connected to the um, the sanitary crisis COVID, but uh, in Lebanon, as the mayor of the Geneva uh, introduces another kind of situation where the the local authorities are more and less what the only thing is left now in this country and they, they still uh, uh, in the front to to help uh, to help uh, people so i'm happy to to be part of this community and uh, I, we are trying our best to you know to uh, to help thank you very much thank you simone um I would like to give back the floor to emilia to our secretary general i think we have had an exciting two panels, uh, very rich uh, with uh, key recommendations actually for the Pact for the Future. And I, as Veronique was saying, we have already um, a good material uh, that we, we, we can structure. Uh, maybe to go back to what is happening in the COP and I leave it in your hands, Emilia. Well, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, very insightful uh, inputs with important links to what is being discussed at COP. But as we were discussing with the Office of the UN Secretary General last night, um, uh, climate issues and the climate emergency discussions might need to be also brought to other discussions. And I found it very interesting uh, to see the um, the uh, sustainable development goals and the voluntary local reviews coming in so strongly um, in, in, into the discussions, because indeed it is about a full agenda. It is about the renewal of the social contract. If, if we don't do that, then we will not be able to address the challenges around informalities, which actually are a majority of the world. And I, I was saying in that first event that Greg Munro was referring to, one of the very festive first events uh, within COP. Um, I I I informal uh, settlements are simply settlements that do not receive services. You know, if we start looking at, at those settlements like that, just like we should be looking at, at migrants uh, as, as people that are not, um, are not uh, full-fledged uh, citizens or formal citizens, or citizens of spaces, but both uh, places and people that they have the uh, right and aspiration to be, uh, to be included and to be provided uh, for by the society, um, then we would be making a different type of, of decisions. Um, I think the main thing I'm taking out of this, of this discussion is that uh, you, local uh, leaders, but also the ecosystem that is surrounding you, uh, our partners that have uh, taken the floor from the Stockholm Plus, uh, plus uh, 50 process, um, to to uh, to the work that is being done by e-commerce and the heritage network, uh, you are all saying that the solutions that we need to find are not techno techno technocracy driven or uh, tech driven. Uh, they are political decisions towards transformation that needs to be embraced by all, uh, and that need to be driven also by by the knowledge 
of the communities. Um, and so uh, when you were asking uh, Firdaus, what would be that one uh, advice that you would uh, provide to this policy council to, to go forward? Um, I was thinking, uh, well, implement the concepts of the, 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 the universal declaration of humanity that Madame Lepage was presenting. Let us make it a reality. Let us go point by point and simply implement it because it transforms the way we relate among each other. We transform the way that we relate uh, to the um, to the planet, and it forces us to uh, to look uh, towards a more territorial perspective of this urban era of, of ours. Um, so I, I think that needs to move forward in, in, in these discussions. And of course, yes, we need to, um, to, to commit to the race to zero, yes. Uh, but we also need to ensure uh, that those that have not reached a certain level um, of, of development uh, have different options and that we, uh, in, in, in some parts of the world, with levels of development that are no longer healthy for our environment and planet, that, that we sacrifice the most and, and, and try to find alternative solutions. I think you, we just need to tell things like they are, like we tell them in any neighborhood or borough meeting, right? Uh, a, a very local down to earth uh, approach for a very big idea that is uh, the sustainability of, of, of the planet and a renewed relationship um, with the multilateral system. And talking about that, I, I wanted, because we, we don't that often get the opportunity to hear live how uh, a meeting between the Secretary General of the United Nations and our delegation went. And uh, we have had many mayors uh, coming and going, hundreds of mayors literally have been visiting COP, but this morning eight of them uh, sat together uh, with, uh, with Antonio Gutierrez and, um, and uh, our colleague, uh, Jean-Baptiste Buffet, uh, the coordinator of, of policy of United Cities and Local Governments World Secretariat, was, uh, I don't know if lucky enough, <laughs> Jean-Baptiste, uh, is, is the description that I should provide, but you, you were there. And so we want to hear from you. What, what were the key messages from the mayors and from Gutierrez and Maimuna uh, Sharif, eh, the ED of, of UN Habitat? How was that? Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Emilia. Well, uh, this morning uh, there was a, a couple of mayors, quite uh, uh, important mayors from the three, three main networks, from UCLG, from, uh, from ICLE, from C40. We had with us the mayor of London, the mayor of Istanbul, the mayor of Kuala Lumpur, the mayor of Austin, Texas, the mayor of uh, Turku, Finland, the mayor of Poitiers in France, the mayor of, of Niteroi, the governor of Kisumu in Kenya, and the councillor of of, of Glasgow to, um, to, to, to push uh, the position of, of local national governments uh, at COP, but also beyond. And it was fascinating to see that even if this was a meeting with the SG, uh, with the COP, the discussion was not only on how cities and regions are making that uh, ecological transformation, uh, that cities and, and the mayor of London used that expression uh, uh, when national governments are delayers, local and regional governments are doers. Um, and, and, and it was fascinating to see that, uh, well, the discussion went really into the global governments. So there is very strong commitment from, from ESG and, and this is was a very positive outcome, but which is actually uh, not new because this is something we have been working on uh, in these uh, in these past months, to to really continue uh, enhancing that structural relations uh, with with us as as a constituency, uh, and not only uh, with 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 UN habitats, but to the global uh, to the global architecture of of uh, of, of the relations between. Uh, local regional governments and, and the UN system. So a very uh, a, a very positive words, very strong, very strong uh, uh, feedback from the uh, from the USSG and and the tour the table of mayors that has shown uh, the diversity of the networks, um, but also the different uh, practices around and some call from intermediary cities 
for stronger capacity and uh, and yeah. and financing uh, uh, yeah, in, in the global south, for example. Um, some concrete uh, decentralized cooperation uh, initiatives, how local and regional governments exchange skills and technologies between north and south, um, the experience of, of cities working through associations, etc. So uh, a very uh, a very powerful meeting. Uh, I think a very very positive one. Um, it's, it's, I think it's the first time we meet with the SGA at the COP, but it's not the first time we, we are able to, to meet these kind of delegations. Thank you. Uh, and I think, yes, um, the, the, the SG uh, and this is very, very, very keen to continue working with us. Yeah, I, in a way, Jean Baptiste, I, I, I kind of think we were discussing yesterday, is, is almost a post-COP meeting. Eh? It, it is, I mean, the negotiations are ongoing, but they are at the point where um, there isn't so much that we can influence. Uh, I mean, we can uh, incur in, in, in trying to, to convince delegations of certain details. But at this point, I think the meeting this morning uh, was focusing on the future and what kind of partnership we have to build between our constituency and the United Nations system, but also other spheres of government to make things happen. Um, so, uh, so I, 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 I too feel uh, that we are here in a positive, silent uh, revolution. <laughs> Let's call it that way. Um, it is, it is, it is positive. It is, it is uh, hopeful, but it is a structural change that that we are uh, looking for. In terms of the rest of the um, of, of the stay there at at COP, uh, just take the opportunity to emphasize that we are still uh, trying to pass some concrete wording to the negotiators as uh, LGMA uh, constituency. Um, and that if you are interested in that, please do let us know if, if you have access uh, to, uh, to your delegation and to negotiators, uh, please do contact our teams uh, so uh, that we can share with you um, those issues that we are uh, that we are pushing uh, for. Um, I would say, dear colleagues, uh, we are coming to the end of a very interesting discussion. Um, we have some homework to go um, to go with. Um, I think on the thematic aspects, um, the circular culture concept, the role of um, addressing informalities as a pathway to equality is coming up very strongly uh, in the resilience discussion. Um, some of our uh, production and consumption models uh, might, uh, they, they are certainly not working and we need to rethink how, for instance, sustainable tourism looks like. Um, and, and that is one of the topics that our colleagues from UCSI are, are bringing. And then in the whole package of crises, I think it will be very important to continue the structural dialogue that we have with the Global Alliance for Urban Crisis. They need to be looking looking at crisis from a more local perspective and not from the macro uh, perspective of humanitarian support. Um, it, it will be very relevant uh, in those uh, places where a lot of um, human mobility will be caused by uh, climate uh, emergency to ensure that there are solid plans for local governance uh, no matter where we go. The situation that we have around the planet right now, and I am looking at the borders of Europe with the Belarusian uh, situation, thousands of migrants are stuck in camps with no local governance at all. And this is going to happen more and more uh, due to the climate emergency and addressing crises from a local governance perspective, building those structures um, are going to be extremely, extremely important. And the articulating role of culture, uh, tangible and intangible, um, is, is going to be um, 
very critical. So a lot of homework ahead. Thank you everybody for your patience, for uh, bearing with us for uh, during this very interesting session. Thank you, Sally, for uh, welcoming us over there in Glasgow. Uh, thank you, Greg, for the partnership with Cities Alliance, uh, Madame Lepage, uh, our colleagues and members. Please keep calm healthy and creative. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, Emilia.